Live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mama Talks. My name is Erin Esteves, also known as OG Mamacita. That stands for officially geriatric because I was old, old, old. At least that's what they told me when I had my son, Cash, who is now four. So thank you for joining us today. We have, um, she seems to be sideways on my film strip. I don't know why, but that's MJ, Mary Jane Fisher from All Things Crunchy. I can't get myself to go. Oh, there we go. Did I go? Oh, no, God. no, you just flipped to the other side. So Okay, whatever. I don't know what's going on. I don't know, but hi. Hi. <laughs> and then um, we also have Ryan McAllister, a PhD joining us from the East Coast. So thank you for taking some time on your, I know it's your vacation, so thank you for taking some time and setting it aside for us today. Thanks for having me. Um, today we're going to be talking about the broken birth system in the United States. And um, Ryan, you your focus is on improving the maternal care, or maternal care or the maternal situation. So. You know, for a lot of first-time parents, um, the when they begin to research what the birthing process is like, not just physically. Honey, shh, can I please have you be quiet? Oh, you're on Twitter? Yay. Okay. Um, <laughs> what the birthing process is like, physically, we also have a lot of medical or institutional things to take into account, which can be really overwhelming. And you are one of many people who believe that our system in the United States is broken. And so you've, you've started this kind of movement or approach called Unbreaking Birth. And um, we have some video links that we'll um, include on the comment page of this that will take you to those discussions. Um, but Ryan, can you tell us a little bit how, for a complete noob, a complete noob, how is the system broken and where are the points that um, we should be looking for more information or questions outside the um, resources that are just handed to us? The system has a number, number of One, one of, the of the problems is that the, there's not enough time like, healthcare practitioners are so squeezed for time that they don't really get to spend very much time with their clients. And so you don't get to form the kind of relationship that would be appropriate for such an intimate thing as going through pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. Another thing that's problematic is that obstetricians who handle most births in the U.S. are trained as surgeons. It's a surgical specialty. And so their job is to be good at doing surgeries. Most women who are giving birth do not need the help of a surgeon. And so it's great to have obstetricians available and obstetrics as a field because sometimes you do need a surgery during birth. But that's not most of the time. And so in this system, women are being put into a pipeline where the practitioner they see is a surgeon and most obstetricians have very little experience with physiological birth. So they believe, or, or in their frame, their training, birth is constructed as a medical problem rather than a natural healthy process. So you put those two things together, looking at birth as, this, as a medical problem and being trained as a surgeon, and what you get is millions of unnecessary surgeries and other procedures performed on moms and their babies every year in the U.S. Maybe I'll stop with those two first, but there are more. I think I think that, that those are, are huge and you know, like I said, for a new and expecting parent, it's overwhelming because mainstream just kind of funnels us into that pipeline that you were talking about. Mm. So there may be some folks that are finding this hangout and and um, researching it this way. But how can we, if can we, how can we make sure that every parent has an idea about the system and how do it, how we can improve it or how they can look at the spot to ask for help? You said how do we make sure that every parent know, like knows where to look for information? 
sorry. Yeah. I... Uh oh. Oh. Oh yes, it, this is a tough day to be for, guys. So I apologize. I'm having a hard time staying focused myself. Um, I I think it's and it, it's what you're trying to get at is that you know there everyone is able to or most people are able to get pregnant and have babies, but they kind of they it's also the kind of their duty to to educate themselves too and and not go into it just believing what their doctors say and knowing that their doctor, usually an OBGYN, is a surgeon. Oh, well, we'd like to have a system in which you could trust the the system you're going into that it would educate you adequately. But our current one doesn't because obstetrics comes with its set of preconceptions and biases about which it itself is perhaps largely unaware at this time. So you can have obstetricians who are very knowledgeable at what they do and know that they're very good at surgeries and, and obstetrics and who believe that obstetrics is the full story about birth so they honestly believe they're giving you the best service so they they neither have the knowledge or the ability or the inclination to provide an educational service and and so the question you ask of how can we make sure moms and their partners know what they're getting into that's a question that I struggle with and that's part of why um, Maryland Families for Safe Birth and I and and um, the Association of Independent Midwives came together and created this Unbreaking Birth Project is because we wanted to try and tell people that there's a lot more to the story than what you see. When you look at, at media representations of birth, you get this very distorted view when you talk to your your OB and your first appointment. Like that's a person who may have never seen uh, typical un, unmodified birth. So there's all of this, this missing discourse, this missing information. Uh, you had mentioned a couple of other points that you wanted to bring up, and you know, at this at this point, I'm just going to kind of let you go because I, I number one, I'm having a hard time concentrating because <laughs> I've got a Mr. Wiggles in my lap, but also because basically, like you said, you and these organizations have come together to talk about how the system is broken. So you're really the guru on this. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to let you rock that one. Well, and it's not just me. It's these organizations. There's a number of people who have been working on this for decades, actually, even before me. So I'm, I'm not unique or a guru. I'm just a scientist who wanted to contribute to this discussion and try and make uh, an easy way for for new people to, to look at this to and hopefully invite them to consider it. You know, we had we had the business of being born come out. That's another attempt to do the same thing. It comes from a very different style. It's a documentary style, whereas my approach is just to combine the scientific data with narratives from actual women's experiences. And then and then we have this panel discussion, by the way, which I think is great because we get moms and birth care providers and a dad to talk about their experiences. Um, and some midwives as well. Um, and those can be seen in that video, the unbreaking birth, correct? Well, there. So there's the unbreaking birth, the half-hour lecture, and then there's the unbreaking birth panel discussion. They're both on the same YouTube channel, but they're separate. We chop them into separate parts. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, we'll make those both available. Um, yeah. Who's on your panel? Who's on the panel? Oh, all kinds of. I mean, we have a lot of people, so it's. Um, Rather than listing them all, I just want to get people to go and watch it. Or if it's too long, right? So it is a long panel discussion. What we've actually done is we took a several um, moments that were particularly poignant, and in, if you expand the description, you can click and it will send you to those particular moments. So right, you get cool. to hear about other things. Also, uh, for example, well, like I said, we have a lot of problems. Two of them are the lack of relationship and time. Obstetricians don't get the luxury of spending a lot of time with their clients and this this sort of over emphasis on intervention and unawareness of physiological birth some other problems include uh, the way that the way that the whole thing is structured as a business obviously and this is not unique to birth we're at a time when that problem is pretty ubiquitous that a lot of things that where people depend on a on a service it's also structured as a business and there's a there's a conflict of interest then right between making money and giving people the safest, most uh, consensual, choiceful kind of uh, service. 
So that's, that's ubiquitous throughout healthcare and a number of other places. Um, and then, of course, we have problems with institutional bias. So people of color, queer people, trans people, people of, of all sorts of identity groups experience even worse treatment in the hospital setting because the care provider is typically not a person with ex of, or of or with great experience with their demographic. And so they will, either through actual bias or through unintended things, do things that are culturally or sensitivity-wise inappropriate, which is very problematic in a medical setting because this is already a time when the person receiving care feels very vulnerable. You know, imagine you're there giving birth and you don't speak the same language as your care provider or you have a complication occur. You're, you know, you're, you're anxious and it's stressful. And that's not the environment that we want birth to occur in, which is, again, why we think that, that a missing part of the system is midwives who have been systematically excluded from their previously preeminent role in birth care over the last 50 years or so. Yeah, I think that you need to feel like you're being cared about, um, so you don't need to feel like you're being discriminated against. And um, like you said in the beginning of this Hangout, the one thing that doctors don't have is time with their patients. How can you actually feel like you're cared about by a provider if you don't actually get a good amount of time and you're actually rushed? Right. Yeah. You know, I think that for a lot of people, I know that in my instance, because I did the, you know, the, the mainstream kind of birthing experience, but I really didn't expect my doctor to spend a lot of time with me. And really, I didn't see my labor or my birthing experience to be something that that couldn't be done by anybody who was on site that day, who happened to be on site. And it's funny because that's how it ended up happening for us is that um, you know, I think during the whole, um, my whole labor, we went through three or four different scheduled route, routes or rotations. So I didn't even know who my doctor was going to be at the moment of pushing. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that for a lot of people, we just, we don't expect, excuse me, senor, we don't <laughs> expect that kind of uh, the one-on-one. -on -one. You know, and I think maybe that's part of the reason that so much is wrong <laughs> because we just kind of almost see it like a fast food kind of situation to where you, you know, it's like getting your, your oil changed on your car. And it's so not. As we know in motherhood, my God, it's like, you know, you are thrown into something that you, if you're a first time mom, you know nothing about and you're so scared so and so vulnerable, you know? So it's like, it is, there is something wrong with not having a connection with, you know, your provider or the backup provider, you know? Um. And this goes to what we were talking about um, before the we started, which was the, the birth plan, because you know, it's really kind of drilled into our heads that your birth plan is this map for your birthing experience and that once you kind of set that in motion, you're good to go. Um, I decided to look at it as a wish, a birth wish list as opposed to a birth plan. Um, and I'm glad I did because there were so many variables that, um, that everybody can, has the possibility of encountering during something like that. So, um, excuse me just a moment, please, Mr. Cassius Smashes. So, <laughs> this is why the show is usually done after dark, okay? I do have to apologize, <laughs> but this is... This is why. I know, and I'm over here like, um, what can you see? I'm cooking. I'm feverishly making my family lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, while I try and wrangle this little guy a little bit, Cassius, really, can you please um, tell us a little bit more about this, um, the unbreaking birth and a few more of those elements? Um, I'd like to save the, the midwifery talk for another show, but can you talk to us more about the, the unbreaking birth, please? Sure. 
So obviously birth itself is not inherently broken. So the unbreaking birth is, is about fixing the system that sometimes messes up a birth that otherwise would have gone perfectly well. And so another way, another problem, or on the flip side, another way you could do that is that in, in our current obstetrical system, the whole birth setting is or, organized around the birth care provider. So the way the body of the mother is positioned, what she's asked to do when she enters the hospital, and many of the interventions are for the convenience or to handle some of the fears of the medical practitioners. Whereas, if you were to organize the whole process around the mother-baby unit and their bodies, their emotional and physical needs, you would have much better outcomes. And so, for a few examples, when a mom comes in the hospital, she's typically told that she should no longer eat or drink anything by mouth. So at birth can be a long process. It's a very athletic process. It's a very emotional process. It can comfort you physically and emotionally to drink water, to be able to eat things. And if you start to get hungry or need more nutrients, what they do is they put you on an IV. So now you have another thing that's uncomfortable. I mean, maybe some people are pretty neutral about IVs. I really don't like having a needle stuck in my arm, wrist, or wherever and taped there, it restricts my ability to move, it makes makes me more uncomfortable. So now you have that as an initial distraction while you're giving labor. Um, oftentimes, it, I think we're seeing back labor, or at least the forcing of back labor, kind of fading out or become discouraged, but it's still a common thing, you know, putting the woman up in this bed and putting her legs in stirrups. You know, and that's not a physiological birth position, it angles the birth canal uphill, so you're, you're trying to push the baby out uphill and it, it actually, because you know the, pel the pelvic bones are like this opening, now you have it rotated this way so, that, so the baby's head is sort of going through due to sort of foreshortening a smaller opening. So that makes birth a lot more painful, you know, increases the demand for pain medication and things like that. Um, those are just a few examples, but we restrict the mom's movement and, and her ability to fulfill her, her instinctual desires, which is very important at that time. Yeah, he's four. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why I did not want to be in a hospital, honestly. I, did, I don't like anything put in my body other than what I want to put in it, and I didn't want a needle. I didn't want somebody telling me where to go and what to do, and, you know, I mean, some people are fine with that, but, yeah, I think that... Um, was one of my main things. And also when my OBGYN said, well, I'm not going to go underneath you like a mechanic, I was like, okay, I need to find a new birth provider because <laughs> you're going to be my mechanic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so the idea of a birth plan, it's useful to try and reflect on how you might like things to go and what might happen and what your backup options are if things go differently than you want. But it's, it's also useful to remember that you don't know how birth is going to go and that it's a very complicated, nuanced process between the mom and the body. That, by the way, is also why a lot of these interventions are problematic because we're taking something complicated and we're messing around with it. We don't fully understand it. You know, birth is not fully understood and everybody's birth is different. So when you go to a hospital and they add these layers of complication, it makes it even less likely that a plan will get followed. And... To, to really, I think your idea of a wish list is, is good or how you hope it will go is a better way to frame it because you can't truly plan out how a birth will go. You can plan out what you want to have available. You know, do I want to have um, the option of getting into the water, right? A lot of women find that, that water birth, especially during the sort of ring of fire moments, really makes it a lot more comfortable. So do I want to have that available to me? You don't want to rigidly plan, I will use the water, but you want to be like, I would like to have the water around in case when in the moment I want to use it. And your body will guide what you want to do. Um, I think that for, for so many people, and I know that for myself, like MJ, you knew that that, 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 that guy, that doctor wasn't going to work for you. And, you know, you had these other avenues or these other resources to... To, to realize that what you wanted was a midwife. I actually saw the business of being born. That's what okay. sold me. Yeah. 
Okay. See, yeah, and I, I didn't have that. I, I hadn't seen it, and I really had no, um, I had no mama tribe. I had no connection. Yeah. I, I didn't know how to go about any of that, much less dealing with the red tape of making sure that my insurance policy covered the expenses between that and and. My our insurance didn't cover a doula because I looked at I did look into that, and um, it it was just very complicated. So I think that that's also part of the broken system in that because we're all funneled into this pipeline, we don't even know that there are these other options. Well, out there. and and the we're funny thing, the funny thing when you mention about the cost is that home birth is probably one-third the cost of having a hospital birth so it's a lot less expensive for our insurance companies but not a lot of them cover it they only cover hospital births so that's, that's another one of the problems to, to fix the birth system we need insurance companies we need to do criminalized midwifery wherever it's still criminalized which thankfully that's we're making a lot of progress there and then we need insurance companies to cover midwifery and to pay them reasonably What? But they're what? women. Aren't they but, supposed to already get like a third of the pay? No, but you know what? Seriously, I would pay my midwives ten times what I paid them for the care that I got and that I continue to get. You, you are. It's amazing. I just, I mean, like seriously. Whenever people talk about the price of having a home birth or having a midwife, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. It's worth it, but it's not accessible to everyone. Right, which right. is why we need insurance companies and Medicaid to pay for it. Because otherwise, well, we still have the system, even after Obamacare, where there's a lot of wealth barriers to access to good care. And so that's a big, that's a big problem. That's a big social justice issue. Everybody Absolutely. should have access to, especially since it's both less expensive and has better outcomes, everyone should have access to midwifery as an option for them. And you know, I think that you you'd mentioned this earlier about how the you know the different ethnic groups have different receive different treatment, and that's that's the way it is. And you know, I compare my niece's treatment at her birth to mine because they were while they were just three months apart, um, in the same city, different hospitals, same last name, but we both had completely different births and that's because she definitely falls more into that Hispanic Chicana kind of look than I do so you know I just I, I, that's one of the reasons I wanted you on the show so that we can get this out there and hopefully get all all of the new parents regardless of ethnic base to see that there are other options besides just following the herd and being told this is how you're going to give birth. One of the panelists uh, in the in the panel discussion is an African American woman whose first birth was in the hospital and whose second birth was with with a midwife. And I encourage folks to click on the link for that timepiece and hear her explanation, her recounting the story of what her experience was like in in the hospital as as an African American woman. I can't imagine because, like I said, just the difference between my niece and myself, same city, same name, huge difference, huge difference. So I appreciate um, the efforts that you and the, the Maryland Association are going through, you know, the... the um, Maryland Families for Safe Birth. Thank you. <laughs> I had it on a piece of paper that was on my desk at some point today. <laughs> so I want to thank you for doing that, and I, I want us to try and make this information as available to as many people as possible. Thank you very much for spreading the word. Thank you. Um, em, how's lunch going? Um, it's looking good. Do you guys want to see? <laughs> Here we go. We got eggs, and we got some potato, sweet potatoes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got through a bunch of garlic in there. Hopefully, it, it'll um, make any type of um, winter illness go away and just stay away. <laughs> oh boy! And just so you give you guys an idea of my day so far. Nah. <laughs> He's been doing that since he was one. 
<laughs> you know, and I, it, the more I learn about these alternative birthing avenues, like I, I really, I'm almost a little heartbroken that I can't have another kid. I mean, I could if I possibly like shot for it right now, but not gonna happen. <laughs> well, you had a pretty, pretty good birth, though, right? It wasn't something that was traumatizing for you. I did. I was lucky in that I had, you know, I, I, I um, birthed at one of the facilities here in San Diego that's known for its mom and baby focused approach. Yeah. Um, so, in a lot of, of respects, I did have less of a mainstream birth in the sense that I got to catch him when he came out. And, nice. You know, we did the extended um, or the delayed cord clamping and. Yeah. Um, have him bathed for the first three days. Um, nice. You know, so there were there were some things that I, it was skin to skin immediate and breastfeeding. All of that was immediate. So there were some aspects that I did get to keep as close to natural as possible. But they induced me, and you know, as soon as that train hit, I asked for the drugs. <laughs> um, hey Ryan, so I was going to ask you. Um, with your being so active in the birth community, do you know or um, are you involved in like red tent events? I don't know if you know what they are actually, but like. Um, no, I haven't involved myself in any red tent events. No, okay. I wonder if like how many moms, you know, that come across your um, your stuff that you, you know, the information that you provide, like let, let them, you know, they let you know that they don't have, they haven't had a good birth or, you know, something was traumatizing. And so, you know, I wonder if those would be intertwining, you know, you having to recommend people to go somewhere for birth trauma. Well, birth trauma is still not largely recognized in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a real issue. I think that... The, um, you know, there's some research that shows that postpartum depression is correlated with highly interventive births. And I think that's a really obvious conclusion, but, and yet, when we talk about postpartum depression in this country, no one's saying, let's look at how we're treating women in pregnancy and the birth period, and, and what about, like, what kind of support are we just dumping them out into the postpartum period? Like, okay, here's your baby, here's your, uh, you know, Here's your wheelchair because, you know, you had a C-section. So here's your six-pound baby. Don't lift anything heavy for a month because you had a C-section and go yeah. home. You no, know, like, is that what we're doing? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. And actually, we've done a few shows on Live with Mama Tribe um, with uh, postpartum um, uh, people that uh, Kara Kedwallader is part of the first 40. And it's, it's a huge thing we're trying to get out there is um, the care that mamas need postpartum because it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it really is. And, you know, um, that is a show completely unto itself. Again, postpartum and, you know, I think it just goes hand in hand with the fact that women are kind of enculturated to keep our mouths shut and to suffer through things. And postpartum is just another example of things we need to shut up about because nobody really wants to hear the gory details. And really, is it that bad? <laughs> well, and we, yeah. live, we live sometimes entrapped by narratives, right? So the narrative is that you know, no matter whatever happened to you at the hospital, you're supposed to be happy if you have a baby at the end. You know? And oftentimes, women who've had unnecessary surgeries, the story they get is that, well, we, shoo, we saved your baby. That was really close there, but we saved your baby by pulling out all the stops. When that whole, that whole like, terrible situation, what didn't even have to happen? And then you go home, and now the narrative you're supposed to be part of is the, I'm a mother, being a mother is the best thing in the world, and I'm so happy, and I'm just this loving mother, and the image of, you know, the exalted image of the mother. And, you know, that's, that story doesn't leave nuance, room for nuance, right? Yeah, you can be a loving mother and be a wonderful mother and also struggle with painful feelings due to a number of things, including how you were treated during the birth process, how this new, this new relationship takes up a lot of space in your life. 
you know, a lot of mothers are very isolated in the postpartum period, even on through um, toddlerhood. Yeah. You know, even the Big ones time. who work, they like go to work and then they take care of their child. It's like, you know, they don't get very much recreational or self-expression time with other adults. And that's an important part of being human to get some of that. So Yeah, even, even just feeding ourselves postpartum is like, oh my gosh, I wanted to cry every time it <laughs> came to a meal time. I was like, we have to eat again. Huh? And then you're breastfeeding, you have to eat all the time. And it's like, if you're already unhappy, you already feel just overwhelmed, like making yourself food is like the last thing you want to do. <laughs> but yeah, that's a whole other show too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate you guys spending time with me today, and I'm sorry that I'm so distracted and um, that I don't have a, a clone to, or a nanny. <laughs> so thank you again for spending time with me today, and um, I look forward to chatting a bit more with you um, about this topic. Thanks very much, and don't worry about being real. It's good to be real. You're helping to deconstruct those narratives, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> there we go. We got video of it, baby. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, yeah it, was, it was definitely messy today. So <laughs> this is it, our house. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>